through Littleton 91.9 and online at nhpr.org. From New Hampshire Public Radio, I'm Laura Canoy, and this is The Exchange. New Hampshire U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan recently called on the Food and Drug Administration to learn from its mistakes with the opioid epidemic. In a letter to the FDA commissioner, Hassan formally requested answers to the agency's past policies on approval of opioid drugs, labeling, and rules around marketing. The demand was just part of a busy week for the senator, which also included U.S. Border Patrol announcing it had reached a breaking point at the Mexican border and a political back and forth over border wall funding and a possible a link to the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard's budget. Today in the exchange, New Hampshire U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan is here, and let's hear from you too. Our email, exchange at nhpr.org. Once again, exchange at nhpr.org. Respond on Facebook or Twitter at NHPR Exchange, or give us a call, 1-800-892-6477, one 800 892 nhpr And Senator Hassan, welcome back. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Let's start with that letter to the FDA Commissioner, Scott Gottlieb. It references a recent 60 Minutes report called, Did the FDA Ignite the Opioid Epidemic? Is that your concern, Senator Hassan, that the FDA may have, um, in the words of this report, ignited the opioid epidemic? So everywhere I go in New Hampshire, uh, people talk to me about the ongoing impact that this opioid epidemic is having on individuals, on families, on our state. Uh, First responders, who I just met with a couple of weeks ago, um, are expressing what they characterize as compassion fatigue. They are going back to the same locations repeatedly to revive people who have overdosed, for example. And frankly, um, the, the most striking thing that I have heard in those discussions is that they are concerned that children are becoming almost um, inured uh, to their parents' drug use and to overdosing and the presence of first responders in their home. Wow. One EMT told me uh, that uh, she went into a home, an 11-year-old little girl was giving CPR to her mother, and it's the second time that that little girl has revived her mother. And so I say that by way of background because the ripple effect of this epidemic is extraordinary. It's something that the Granite State is living with, uh, people across the country are living with. And even as we begin to contain, uh, you know, I hope, uh, the number of deaths that we're seeing from this epidemic, the long-term effects, especially trauma on children, uh, especially on grandparents now raising their grandchildren, uh, is going to be with us for a long time. So it's absolutely critical that we understand not only how to treat substance use disorder and get more resources to the front line, something I've been working on uh, with Senator Shaheen, other members of the delegation. Uh, I'm glad we got significantly more resources uh, to help uh, set up uh, more structured response in New Hampshire. But we have to understand how we got here. And we have to understand as well uh, whether our own Food and Drug Administration, the agency charged with making sure that our uh, prescription drugs are safe, um, whether they, wittingly or unwittingly, had a hand in in overemphasizing or encouraging and supporting the overprescribing of these opioids. What and specifics are you looking for? So what we're Hansen? looking for there is a process for approving a drug um, that includes a label that describes how physicians should use that drug and whether there are side effects that they should be worried about. And along the way, it appears that the FDA um, made an assumption, uh, incentivized in some way or persuaded, let's say, by drug companies, that because of the way um, oxycodone in particular uh, was structured to be long release, that it would be less addictive. And it is not clear that 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 was ever tested, uh, that there was any evidence to really support that. And I'm very concerned that because of maybe taking a shortcut here, being pressured by pharmaceutical companies to get this product to market, that the FDA may have 
skipped some critical steps along the way. And that really could have helped fuel the crisis because we know part of this crisis really was started when doctors were encouraged to prescribe opioids on the ground, these super opioids, on the grounds that they weren't going to be addictive. What's the larger goal, Senator Hassan, of asking these questions of the FDA commissioner, of sending the letter? Is it stronger oversight of the FDA? Is it legal culpability for the agency? Is it making a moral statement? Is it putting more of a spotlight on the companies themselves and their motivations? There's a lot of for, emphasis for, now on First of all, a- any time you see a crisis like this one, an epidemic like this one, you have to make sure that you are getting to the root of it so you hope it it, it never happens again. So that's part of it. The other piece of it is that uh, I want the FDA to be accountable to the American people. We need to understand if, in fact, it made mistakes. Uh, we need anybody working um, for the federal government or any entity for that matter, uh, who had a hand in causing a problem to be held accountable for it. That's really important. I want uh, everybody who works uh, in the public health area in particular to know that they're accountable for their actions. But let's also realize that we know that big pharma, um, particularly Purdue and Janssen & Janssen, um, really worked to pressure doctors to prescribe these opioids. And it looks like they really worked hard to make sure that the FDA would do things their way. And to the degree that we want to hold these pharmaceutical companies culpable and responsible and get resources from them to help us fight this epidemic, uh, what happened at the FDA may be very critical. A listener, Cody, sent us a question about this. He asks, what have you done to end the opioid crisis? And Cody, thank you for the question. And Senator Hassan, you mentioned earlier the grant that you and the delegation and the governor brought to the table, $45 million dollars over two years. What are your impressions, Senator Hassan, about how these monies are now being dispersed here in New Hampshire, this hub-and-spoke system now called the doorway? And it actually now turns out to be um, more than $46 million over two years. So uh, before we did this uh, bipartisan spending agreement last spring uh, that upped the uh, amount of resources for opioids. New Hampshire was getting about $3 million a year. Then it was announced we'd get $46 million. And we actually, in a bipartisan spending agreement in September, added even more money to that. So now New Hampshire will get another 11 or $12 million. So that's good news. Um, and that uh, will fund this hub and spokes idea. And that's something I heard a lot about from first responders over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they, especially in places like Manchester and Nashua, they're hoping that there will be more resources in some of the other parts of the state uh, so that people can get treatment close to home and that we're we're spreading out um, uh, the work here a little bit. Um, But we should understand that as important as these steps are – the biggest mistake we could make to think that we're it, it, that we're somehow near done. We need to focus on not only having a hub and spoke system, but also having the workforce uh, that can support that system so that people can get treatment. Huge challenges. Uh, yeah, in getting and so one of the things we've done just jobs. to 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 add to to what um, Cody was asking about is in addition to dollars, uh, we've taken steps to make it easier for providers to get the kind of permission they need to do medication-assisted treatment. Medication-assisted treatment is the gold standard. Uh, We also uh, have uh, put into this uh, Comprehensive Support Act um, provisions that would allow us to expand integrated prevention, treatment, and recovery centers. Uh, We've also taken steps to allow there to be more patients in a drug treatment facility funded by Medicaid, again, so we can get at the need and the demand here for treatment. Uh, But we've got a long way to go, and we know that. One more question on this, and then I did want to turn to climate change with you, Senator Hassan, because I received a lot of emails from folks about climate bills, climate policy, and so forth. But one more question about this. As we talk about the hub-and-spoke system and the money that has come in now to fund this, Looking at the numbers, it seems that a fair number of people coming in to these treatment centers are seeking help, not just with opioid abuse, but other types of addiction, especially alcohol, meth. We asked HHS Commissioner Jeffrey Myers last week about this, and he said the grant targets opioid addiction, 
But he said, no one's being turned away. We can use Medicaid money to help treat people who come in with other types of addiction. Still, how does that strike you, Senator Hassan? We have this large federal grant, a lot of money. Everybody says that's good. But opioids only when we know addiction wrecks lives no matter what substance we're talking about. And and first of all, I I thank Commissioner Myers for the work he and his team have been doing. Um, And Yes, Medicaid Medicaid dollars, uh, starting with the Medicaid expansion system we put in place, uh, can provide support and coverage for treatment of any type of um, substance misuse. Uh, But we are hearing that we're seeing a growing meth problem. Uh, Senators from other states uh, in different parts of the country actually are saying that meth is a bigger issue for them, for instance, than uh, opioids. So it's one of the things I'm going to be taking back uh, to D.C. with me to talk with um, our HHS folks there and just see whether there are tweaks or adjustments we should make. Uh, but to Commissioner Meyer's point right now, um, nobody's being turned away, and we will continue to fight to find resources uh, that will address all kinds of substance use disorders. So that's interesting. So you seem to be saying, Senator Hassan, that you're going to be looking at this issue right. of Um, Are these federal funds too tightly constrained? Can we open it up a little bit to allow them to be used? What I wouldn't want to have happen, look, opioids are unbelievably deadly, and they are our frontline concern right now. They're taking almost 500 people lives a year in New Hampshire. Um, and Which is stunning, more than one person a day. Yeah, and and so um, I don't want to restrain our resources in terms of – going after opioids. But I also understand that sometimes people are presenting with complex needs and we need to make sure we have resources to help people with this illness, regardless of what the substance they're using is. I want to remind our listeners that you can join us. Our number here on the exchange is one 800 892 You can send us an email exchange at nhpr.org. And our guest for the hour is New Hampshire U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan. And Senator Hassan, I want to switch gears to climate change. Sure. I got a lot of feedback from listeners on this. And I want to let everyone know we're doing a whole show on the Green New Deal on Thursday, how young Republicans and young Democrats in the state feel about it. But in terms of climate, Senator Hassan, you said you want, quote, bite-sized climate solutions. So what's an example of a bite-sized well, climate what, solution? Look, um, let's be really clear. Uh, we need to address climate change. It is an existential threat, and we need to do it urgently. Um, we also need to do it uh, across party lines. Uh, we need to get moving on it now. And so, you know, I haven't And don't support the Green New Deal because it involves a lot of provisions that I think will be a distraction and cause more arguments uh, while we have this pressing need in front of us that we need to be addressing right now. So we need to expand things like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, something that I worked on in the state Senate and as governor. uh, We need to provide incentives for investments in clean energy, to be sure. Uh, We need to work on energy efficiency within our buildings. One of the most basic things we could do is work to make sure that the federal government's buildings are much more energy efficient and use uh, green energy, uh, something that would have a real and significant impact. There, There is item after item here that we know we can do. We could work on net metering. Uh, I put in a bill that would uh, make sure that states understood best practices in net metering so more and more people uh, could uh, be incentivized to use green energy in their homes and sell back their excess to the grid. And we could, all, debate here in New Hampshire. We, we could all benefit from that. Uh, those are the kinds of things we can do right now that get us started, that have a real impact. Um, and as we incentivize uh, clean energy jobs and clean energy solutions, uh, I think we will see um, – a growing and better and better uh, impact. Um, And if there are more comprehensive things people want to talk about, we can talk about those too. But I don't want the debate over things that aren't directly related to climate change to derail our efforts. And since we know there are things that can work, we've seen them work in, in 
a variety of places. We should get going on those right now. Well, speaking of clean energy, I got a couple emails toward that point. Stephanie says America needs to get off fossil fuels. None of New Hampshire's legislators will call for a moratorium on gas expansion. Stephanie says, how is this acting on climate? And Lauren Pennacook also sent us a note about natural gas. Scientists tell us we will face catastrophic climate change if we do not dramatically reduce fossil fuel emissions. Laura says fracked gas is actually methane, a potent greenhouse gas, which has been touted as a bridge fuel and which we are producing and transporting in large quantities. So Laura also wants to know what would you do to reduce the use of fracked gas to help preserve our planet Earth? Thank you, Laura and Stephanie, for those questions. And, you know, we do use a lot of natural gas in New England, especially in New Hampshire. And we kind of congratulate ourselves and say, hey, this is cleaner than coal. But they're right. It's still a greenhouse gas. It, it especially the methane emissions from the fracking process uh, have a real impact here. So I think the question is a really well placed one. When natural gas and when fracking uh, f- was first developed uh, and produced uh, more cheaper natural gas, I think people did think, "Gee, this is better than coal. Um, th- this is better." Uh, than oil. And so it's a good bridge fuel. I think the evidence now says that it's not as good as we thought. Uh, As always, what we have to do is balance um, the need for cleaner and cleaner energy with the quality of life demands that Americans make. Uh, But I think, again, if we direct dollars to investing in more wind, more solar, uh, and other clean energy solutions, and the storage capacity uh, for those kinds of energy, uh, we will see less and less reliance on natural gas. And I think the points are very well taken. Well, and I got a couple emails. I won't read all of them, but several on a specific bill in the House of Representatives. I'll read Rachel's email. Um, She says, I'm aware that a bill called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which would place a revenue neutral fee on carbon dioxide causing pollutants, is currently on the floor of the U.S. House. I'm wondering if Senator Hassan would be willing to support it if it comes before the Senate for a vote. So um, revenue neutral carbon fee, what some people call a a carbon tax, Senator Hassan. I will look at the bill. I haven't looked at that one closely. Um, Again, uh, I think it's really important to invest in steps that move us uh, as quickly as we need to go. And I uh, want to make sure uh, that any proposal doesn't distract and take us away from that. But I will look very closely at that. Given that the U.S. Senate is Republican-controlled, what solutions might there be in the Senate, Senator Hassan, that could move the needle on emissions, on clean energy, some of the priorities that you talked about? What's the bipartisan solution, if any? Well, Maybe it's too partisan. I don't know. So, so one of the great disappointments I have uh, with the current Senate Republican majority is their refusal to bring onto the floor of the Senate proposals that would address climate change. Uh, We have seen in recent weeks a few of my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle actually acknowledging on the Senate floor that climate change is real and that human behavior is a major cause of it. Uh, That's a giant step forward because we have had silence on the floor about this other than uh, Republicans uh, taking to the floor to defend the fossil fuel industry. Um, One of the things we have been pushing our Republican colleagues to look at is that the insurance industry is now predicting that climate change is going to have a real negative impact on property values, especially coastal property values because of sea level rise. And so, you know, what we've been trying to say to them is, look, if Huge global insurance companies say climate change is real, and huge global insurance companies say that humans have uh, had a significant role to play in it. Will you guys now believe that it's real and take some action? So the question I now have is, will the Republicans actually do something now that some of them are acknowledging it's real? We will talk a lot more after a short break. Stay with us. This is The Exchange on NHPR. This is NHPR. Good morning. NPR's White House correspondent Tamara Keefe will be the featured speaker at NHPR's Justice and Journalism, a partnership with the Warren B. Rudman Center at the UNH School of Law. She'll also join host Laura Kanoy on the exchange to discuss the national political landscape and answer your questions. Don't miss Tamara Keith on the exchange this Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. here on NHPR. 
Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and support also comes to us from New England College, filling the summer and fall 2019 classes now. Information and application at nec.edu. And from Dartmouth-Hitchcock's North Cotton Cancer Center, a National Cancer Institute-designated cancer center, more at cancer.dartmouth.edu. Partly to mostly sunny for today, windy, high temperatures mid-30s to the mid-40s. This is NHPR. This is The Exchange. I'm Laura Kanoy. Today we're sitting down with U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan, a Democrat from New Hampshire, and we're hearing from you. Send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. Respond on Facebook or Twitter at NHPR Exchange or give us a call, 1-800-892-6477, one 892 nhpr Senator Hassan, we've talked about the opioid crisis. We've talked about climate change. Let's move on to immigration. This has been huge, right. huge news recently. And just on Friday, President Trump complained to reporters about what he called Mexico's failure to stem the migrant influx. We've all heard about these rising numbers. And then in a tweet the next day, he said, if they, meaning Mexico, don't stop them, we're closing the border. We'll close it. We'll keep it closed for a long time. I'm not playing games, the president said. You sit on the Homeland Security right. Committee. Should the border be closed temporarily to get this problem under control? The quick answer is we do a massive amount of trade with Mexico and others over the Mexican border every single day. So the impact to our economy would be significant. Uh, and th- it's not a productive suggestion from the president. Uh, and I wish uh, that he would um, – do some listening to the people on the front lines. I was at the border last spring uh, visiting with uh, our CBP agents and others, and then I went from the border, uh, spent a couple of days on the border, and then actually went down to Mexico City to talk to Mexican officials. Um, Here's what I heard from our CBP frontline personnel. Uh, We need more personnel Uh, We need more infrastructure like roads. Uh, They need more uh, in a variety of vehicles like ATVs and in some cases horses uh, to patrol uh, certain kinds of terrain. Yes, in certain places they need strategically placed fencing. Uh, And you've seen both Democrats and Republicans agree that we should invest in more uh, strategically placed fencing and repair some of the fencing that we have. Um, But what is critical here is that as we have this discussion, uh, we realize that threatening our neighbor to the south, with whom we do a great deal of trade, um, and who has been an ally of ours, uh, isn't going to build the kind of relationship that will help us get at the underlying conditions that are causing these migrant flows. Uh, So also this weekend, the president said that he wanted to stop all aid to countries in the Northern Triangle, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, uh, as if punishing Uh, those countries would somehow uh, convince people who are desperate enough to make this incredibly difficult journey up to the Mexican border uh, change their minds. Uh, That disregards the root causes of these migrant flows. Uh, We know that that foreign aid is helping local governments uh, begin to address things like gang violence, um, which is one of the reasons you see uh, people take this incredibly risky journey up to the border. So we need to be having constructive conversations with our neighbors to the south about how we can help stem the migrant flows. Uh, But we shouldn't be uh, politicizing this and we shouldn't be threatening these neighbors. And we need to have a policy at the border that's also consistent with our values, which also means that the administration's decision to separate children from families is unacceptable and unconscionable, and we have to continue to stand up to that. And I wish uh, we were marshalling all our resources right now at this increased migrant flow we see and finding constructive ways to deal with it at the border rather than having uh, this kind of policy by tweet uh, that just ratchets up um, the debate and the argument without getting to a bipartisan solution to the issue. So two questions. Long term, you're looking at the foreign aid to those countries where there is, as you said, a lot of violence, and that's why people are streaming up toward the border. But as you know, Senator Hassan, there's concern that, you know, USAID goes to governments that are almost as guilty as the gangs, that they're sort of in cahoots with the people who are conducting the violence. So 
some people say, well, what good is that foreign aid doing anyway? So look at the situation of, down there the, now. One of the helping. things our diplomatic corps does is work with governments to reform, to help police uh, learn how to be the kind of uh, non-corrupt um, police force that Americans take for granted uh, in our own society. Uh, we know how important the work that our diplomats are doing. It's gang violence. It's also poverty uh, in these places. Um, so it would be nice if we could deliver resources and change things overnight, but that isn't the way this works historically. The foreign aid that the president is talking about um, uh, cutting off, as I understand it, uh, has really only been going to these countries uh, for a couple of years. So it's and too early it's to too assess early to success. tell. But look, um, when I went to Mexico City, I met with folks from our State Department about the work they are doing. Among other things, they're helping um, the Mexican uh, law enforcement officials learn how to build cases against drug cartels that would survive in an American court so that if people were extradited to the United States, uh, our cases against these uh, cartel leaders uh, would be successful. Um, that's the kind of work our diplomats can do that will have a long-term impact. But in the meantime, there are important and strategic things we need to do at the border to alleviate uh, yeah, let's this talk intense short term. flow. Right. Um, so short but, term, but what do you, the, the president's, what would you like to see? Uh, you know, the president's threats and Twitter make that hard for us to do. And this focus on one big wall and uh, a continuing fight with Congress and uh, threats to take money that we've appropriated for other things uh, to build a wall rather than invest in uh, the kind of short-term solutions, increase of facilities, increase of personnel down at the border, um, is really frustrating. Let's take some calls, Senator Hassan. And again, our number, if you'd like to join us, is one 800 89 Email is great, exchange at nhpr.org. And Paul's calling from Pembroke. Go ahead, Paul, you're on the air with Senator Hassan. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much. Good morning, Senator Hassan. Good morning, Paul. Um, Go I ahead. Have, um, I have a question as far as the statement that you made, and I was just curious as to, maybe you could uh, expand on it, but why would it be the United States issue to come to the finding of why immigrants are crossing the border and coming into America? Wouldn't that be the country's they're coming from's issue of why they want to come to America. The reason I want to come here is because America is great. Right. But I don't think that I don't think we should be focusing on why they want to come here. Well, thank you, Paul, for the call. Th thank you, Paul, for the call and for the question. So um, we have increasing number of migrants right now on our border who are seeking asylum, uh, something that our country's law says they have a right to do. Um, because we have always considered ourselves uh, to be a country uh, that welcomes uh, newcomers who want to come here and build a better life because, as you said, America's great. It's the greatest country in the world, and people want to come here. Um, what we also, though, want to do is have an orderly uh, process uh, when people come to the border seeking asylum uh, so that we aren't straining our resources, so that we can make sure that we're keeping our border secure, so that we can devote resources at the ports of entry not only uh, to making sure that trade flows easily, but so that we uh, detect and catch um, smugglers uh, when they're trying to smuggle drugs over the border, for instance. We need to be able to have an orderly and safe border. And for us to do that, it would be good if we could stem the tide of migrants uh, to our border. Um, and, under, and to do that, uh, understanding why they're coming is really important. And what we know is that in the Northern Triangle, for instance, uh, we are seeing increasing levels of poverty and chaos and gang violence uh, to, to the point where um, migrants feel they have no other choice but to make what is, by all accounts, an incredibly arduous journey uh, to our border. So we should be working uh, to, you know, to try to uh, change some of the conditions with the home countries. I mean, it's their responsibility to improve their country, but it's in our self-interest, frankly, to help them do that. And so when we have a self-interest, it seems to me that one of the ways we can uh, make this better is, you know, 
work with those home countries to try to improve conditions so we don't see this kind of sudden flow on our border uh, that creates its own set of issues and its own set of uh, risks for us. Paul, thank you very much for the question. And I have just two more questions sure. on immigration for you, Senator Hassan, and then I do want to move on to water contamination here in New Hampshire. As you know, that's been a big, big yeah. issue and also some of the education bills that you've been working on. But Talking about the border, you did vote with the Senate to overturn the president's national emergency declaration to use Pentagon funds to build a border wall. Why did you oppose that effort, Senator Hassan? Well, first of all, um, as the president himself has said, uh, this isn't really an emergency in the sense that the national emergency act was established. Um, And secondly, uh, we have a process uh, under the Constitution that says Congress appropriates money uh, and makes decisions about how to spend money. Uh, We, in a bipartisan way, at the end of the last year, voted for a government funding bill that included significant resources for border security, including some fencing in some places. Uh, We understood from the White House that they agreed that this was a reasonable approach. And then at the 11th hour, the president decided to veto it and, as we all know, shut down the government over it it for about 35 days, which was unacceptable and wrong. Um, I believe strongly that we need to strengthen our border security. We need to do it in a way that is strategic and smart, and we need to listen to our frontline personnel. And I also think uh, that the president of the United States uh, is violating the Constitution when he takes money that we have already voted to appropriate in bills that he signed. He agreed with us, for instance, that the funding for the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard for these new projects that will help us do our job at Portsmouth even better. Remember, we maintain, repair, and modernize the entire attack class of submarines in the United States in the Portsmouth Navy Shipyard. Uh, We need critical improvements and modernizations at the shipyard to do that better um, and help secure our country. And he signed a law that appropriated money for that purpose, and now he's talking about going back, back and taking that money away for a war that, uh, for a wall that experts tell us isn't the best way to secure our border. So there's the macro issue, which right. a lot of Democrats have said. But for you in particular, and Senator Shaheen, there's the micro issue of some of the funds that could be yanked from Pentagon spending bills, already approved, as you said, might come from the Portsmouth Naval Shipyards budget. That's been a big concern. Uh, th- that is a huge concern. But look, th- this is a concern of many, many members of Congress. Um, the Constitution says Congress comes together and decides how to appropriate money. Uh, and in this case, the president actually signed the bills in which we appropriated money all around the country for critical defense projects. And now the president, because he couldn't keep a campaign slogan, a campaign promise, is talking about taking money away from critical projects that earlier he agreed were really important. Otherwise, he wouldn't have signed our appropriations bill. Well, Governor Sununu has said that, hey, if Democrats had worked with the president on border security instead of fighting with him, the shipyard's funding wouldn't even be in question. So I wonder how you feel about that, Senator Hassan. Uh, That's a pretty ridiculous statement. Um, And I'm disappointed uh, that um, Governor Sununu has not joined me and the rest of the delegation in calling on the administration to uh, keep the funding for the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Uh, We appropriated the money. We secured the funding. We worked in a bipartisan way on a spending agreement that the president told us through his officials at the White House he supported. And then at the end of the day, when he got political pressure uh, from uh, TV commentators uh, that he wasn't doing enough to build, you know, to keep this one campaign promise, he shut down the government over it. And I wish the governor, uh, frankly, uh, was standing up to the president on this and uh, working with him because we did have an agreement uh, about investing more money on border security with the president. And at the last minute, he changed his mind. What are the chances, realistically, Senator Hassan, that this is going to happen, that those pots of money that were already assigned, as you said, for defense projects all over the country, not just here in New Hampshire, what are the chances, really, that this is going to happen? Because Senator Shaheen asked a top Navy official about this, and he said, you know, 
Uh, this list was just based on a certain set of criteria. There's going to be a whole other process to determine what projects actually might see funds diverted. So the Navy, anyway, seemed to say, don't worry too much about this. I, I hope very much that the Navy is correct here. And I hope that uh, this turns out to be just some hyperbole uh, from the president. The thing is, my job is to stand up for our state and our country and make sure we have the resources we need to keep us safe and to stand up for the incredible uh, men and women of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard who uh, do their jobs often uh, ahead of schedule and under budget year in and year out to keep us safe. And um, the thing about this administration is that we have seen uh, unpredictable, um, unprecedented behavior and actions. So as much as the Navy is trying to reassure us, uh, so far that doesn't mean the president won't differ with his own Navy. I want to pivot to the issue of infrastructure and share an email from Andrew in Keene who says, with the discussion of infrastructure being mentioned now and again, especially by the governor, nobody seems to mention the transportation systems in our state rather than just, quote, roads and bridges. Andrew says the state receives just $1 million to fund every single program and system, which is very hard for various regional coordinating councils to work with. Andrew asks, would the senator be willing to try and get additional funds for supporting public transportation in New Hampshire? Andrew, thank you so much for the question. And we spoke with the head of the Manchester um, right. Airport just last week, and a lot of listeners called in and said they're very frustrated that you can't get to Manchester by public transit, really. Right. I mean, you can, but you have to take like two buses and switch and, and so on and so right. forth. Andrew, thank you. Well, uh, Andrew, it's a great question. And uh, yes, I would be uh, willing and am very interested in helping us increase investments in public transportation. As I think uh, most of your listeners know, while I was governor, I was a strong supporter of extending commuter rail uh, up to Nashua and Manchester. And uh, it would be great if we could link a commuter rail with Manchester Airport, uh, among other things, that would allow Manchester Airport, as I understand it, to qualify as an international airport if we decided to uh, try to grow it in that way. So there is a lot of work we could do here, and it would be um, good for our quality of life, good for our environment, and good for our economy, which is why I think you also see Chambers of Commerce in New Hampshire supporting things like an extension of commuter rail. And so uh, I'll continue uh, to work with my colleagues. At, you know, One of the things that we are hoping we can find bipartisan support on uh, moving forward in this Congress and beyond is around infrastructure and um, beyond it, roads and bridges. Beyond which roads is and bridges, traditional just, version yeah. of uh, and certainly look, we need roads and bridges. We need broadband infrastructure, especially in rural places in in New Hampshire and elsewhere in this country, um, and we need public transport. Isn't part of the problem, and I'm asking you this now with your background as a governor, isn't part of the problem in terms of public transportation? that New Hampshire's constitution says you can't use state gas taxes for anything but roads and bridges. Right. That we, had a, we have a constitutional provision uh, that the Supreme Court of New Hampshire has interpreted in that way. So uh, we have a limited what we call the highway fund, um, and it's written that way. Uh, so one of the things we have to do is find uh, other resources, but that's one of the places where I think we could uh, find the resources uh, perhaps in partnership with Massachusetts and partnership with the federal government and partnership with some of uh, New Hampshire's own funding uh, to work on this issue. All right. Coming up. Thank you for that email, Andrew. It's a good point. And um, coming up, we're going to talk a little bit more about health care. We'll also get the senator's reaction to the recent summary of the Mueller report released by the attorney general. And we'll get Senator Hassan's thoughts about the very large Democratic field running for the presidential nomination on the Democratic side. All that's coming up, plus your questions and comments, 1-800-892-6477. Stay with us. Border Protection Chief Kevin McAleenan says his officers are trying hard to prevent further tragedies at the southern border. The agency says its facilities are at the breaking point. 
few debates have become as partisan as the one over immigration. How should we respond to the growing crowds huddled behind chain link fences? Next time on 1A. That's this morning at 10 here on NHPR. Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and support also comes to us from Ansel and Anderson, trust in the state attorneys in Bedford, helping families transfer wealth from one generation to the next on the web at ansellpa.com. And from Granite State College, offering diverse degree programs designed to help working adults advance. Registration and information at granite.edu. This is NHPR. This is The Exchange. I'm Laura Kanoy. This hour, we're sitting down with New Hampshire U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan, a Democrat and former governor of New Hampshire. Senator Hassan sits on the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, although the, also the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. You can join us with your comments and questions for the senator, 1-800-892-6477. Email exchange at NHPR. Dot org. And Senator Hassan, right back to our listeners. Peter is calling in Derry. Hi, Peter. You're on the air. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Peter. Uh, I wonder why we allow Donald Trump to use the border as a squirrel-type diversionary issue. Every time something really important like climate change, right. like health care, like education, like opportunity... Every time it comes up, he runs back to the border issue, and everybody runs over and starts talking. How much of your show has been spent talking about the border issue, and how much of your show so far has been spent talking about even more important issues? Thank you so much for the call, Peter. Go ahead, Senator Hassan. Well, look, thank you for the the question, Peter. And let me just start by saying that, you know, when I think about... uh, the overall task at hand, uh, I focus on how we can expand middle class opportunity uh, for our working families, for our small businesses. Uh, certainly, fighting the opioid epidemic is a priority uh, for all the reasons we've talked about. Lowering health care costs, especially the high cost of prescription drugs, is critical. Um, but we also can never forget that to, in order to do those things domestically, we have to keep our country safe, secure, and free. The first job of any government is safety. And so while I am concerned that the president keeps talking about a campaign promise he made around the border wall, um, I do think it is important that we work together across party lines to make sure uh, that we are securing our borders appropriately in a way that's consistent with our values. Right now, we are seeing a kind of uh, spike uh, that's pretty significant in migrant flow to the border, and that is stressing our resources, and that is something we need to attend to. Um, But that being said, uh, I take your point that uh, we have dealt with this kind of migrant flow, you know, in the past, we have seen spikes in terms of flow before, and we should be able as Americans uh, to address that while also focusing on the need to combat climate change, uh, which is the existential threat we face, along with um, looking at the other security issues we face, aggression uh, from China, North Korea, Russia, and Iran, uh, terrorism, uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, Those are things we have to be able to focus on, too. And uh, I think it's really important uh, that we continue uh, to reach across party lines to do that and not let the latest tweet distract us. Well, let's talk about health care, since you mentioned it and Peter did as well. And thank you again, Peter. The percentage of uninsured Americans is going up, according to several reports. How much is that a reflection, Senator Hassan, on the Affordable Care Act? We know that health care costs uh, are too high. And one of the real drivers of that right now and has been for a while is the high cost of prescription drugs. Um, what has been really important about the Affordable Care Act, uh, which we need to continue to work to improve, is that it has provided uh, coverage for 
millions and millions of Americans who didn't have it before. And here in New Hampshire, for instance, uh, the Affordable Care Act allowed us to expand Medicaid, which people on the front lines continue to tell us is the single most important thing we did in terms of getting resources to the front lines so that people could get the treatment they needed uh, to uh, deal with with their substance use disorder and get into recovery. Uh, there is a lot more work to do um, to improve and stabilize the Affordable Care Act. One of the things uh, we saw uh, is that in some areas of the country, uh, insurers began to pull out of some of the markets. And one of my concerns right now is that the administration uh, continues to take acts that undermine the Affordable Care Act, destabilize it, uh, make its future less predictable, which means that insurance carriers uh, who have to kind of hedge their bets um, either pull out of these markets or increase their prices, uh, partly because some of the things the government did to help stabilize things have been undermined or sabotaged by this administration. Now we have an administration that has gone, has joined a lawsuit to repeal the entire Affordable Care Act, which means that people with pre-existing conditions uh, would no longer be guaranteed coverage, uh, which means that we would continue uh, to see uh, more expensive and more fragmented um, health care in this country, and it would end Medicaid expansion at a time, by the way, that states that are conservative, like Utah and Nebraska, have by referendum authorized Medicaid expansion. So uh, there are things we need to do to improve uh, and lower the cost of health care, especially around prescription drugs. But right now, we are having to try to ward off this administration's attempt to undermine it. And that is one of the things that is making it hard to address the overall cost issue. Well, I have read that Republicans in the Senate and the House, and I wonder what you think, Senator Hassan, yeah. since you're in the Senate, um, have zero appetite for tackling the Affordable Care Act at this point. They are kind of letting the White House stand alone on this thing. Yeah, uh, they are letting the, 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 the... Some of the Republicans are saying that they don't want to deal with it. But let's be clear, uh, their president and this administration has gone to court to say that the Affordable Care Act should be repealed. And they should be standing up to him and saying, let's work on it. Now, let me give you an example of some of the bipartisan work we are doing. Um, on health care. On health care. There is this issue of surprise medical bills. I know you've heard about it here in New Hampshire. Uh, New Hampshire State Legislature has a, has addressed it, uh, but there's a whole group of health care plans that state law doesn't cover. Um, surprise medical bills are those bills that people get they when they've gone to an in-network facility uh, or to an in-network provider, let's say in an emergency room, and after they leave, they get a bill from uh, somebody who worked for that hospital who wasn't who was in network, who was yes. just there for the day or never signed up with that insurance company to be in network. And these bills can be really massive, right? And so um, I think the patient needs to be taken out of this. This is a debate, but a dispute between an insurance company and a health care provider. Let them solve it. So I put in a bill at the end of this year to do just that. Uh, Senator Cassidy, a Republican from Louisiana, put in a bill uh, along with some others. And we are now working together. We just had uh, an information session for other senators on it this week. Uh, I am hopeful that that's something we can address in a bipartisan way uh, through our help committee. Um, that's the type of progress we should be making. Well, and NHPR's Casey McDermott did a ton of reporting right. on that. We followed up with a show. Yeah. So if folks want to learn more, definitely go to the archives because right. it was a big, big issue. But speaking of the Affordable Care Act and what some people say is the unaffordable care act because prices have not gone down as much as, as uh, expected. The number of uninsured Americans is going up, although you cited um, the reasons why you think that's happening, Senator Hassan. Some of your fellow Democrats running for president are saying, look, given all this that I just mentioned, the Affordable Care Act doesn't go far enough. Prices are still too high. People are still dropping out of coverage. Let's just go for Medicare for all, where the government is the single payer. We hear this on the presidential campaign trail. And wonder what you think, Senator Hassan. I, I think what's really important is that we work to make sure that as we move forward here, we are committed to the concept that health care is a right Every American should be able to get health care coverage. Uh, we have to understand that no matter what system we have in place, 
there are things we need to do in this country to lower the overall cost of health care, and prescription drugs is a big piece of that. I've supported legislation that would lower prescription drug prices by letting our Medicare program negotiate for prescription drug prices, uh, would let the safe importation of drugs from Canada uh, into our country, um, and also to close some of the loopholes that allow pharmaceutical companies to um, draw keep their uh, patents longer than they're supposed to and keep certain brand name drugs very expensive. So there are things we can do to lower health care costs. I am concerned when I hear about some of the uh, proposals uh, right now uh, about the impact that those proposals would have as you transition people from one system to the next. It can be very disruptive to change healthcare systems, especially if you're somebody with complex medical needs. I'm also concerned about the upfront costs of some of these proposals. So I, as a member of the Health Education, Labor, and Pensions, or HELP Committee, uh, will certainly consider any proposal that comes forward. Uh, but in the meantime, I think what's important is that we work across party lines, like on surprise medical bills. Uh, we work to preserve the Affordable Care Act and really fight this administration's attempts to undermine and sabotage that act. And that moving forward, uh, we uh, continue to work to drive down the cost of health care, particularly right now, uh, pharmaceuticals. There, The cost of prescription drugs is a major driver in health care. And we did get an email about the cost of yeah. prescription drugs. So it sounds like, Senator Hassan, when it comes to a single-payer program like some of these candidates are proposing, you've got some real concerns. You're not ready to jump in with both feet on that. When you are talking about people's health care, you have to understand how things are actually going to work when a system is deployed and what the impact on the people who need health care is going to be. We all, at some point in our lifetime, need health care. Some of us are luckier than others, right? We, we go through life without a whole lot of health care issues. Others of us uh, have complex medical needs or develop them or get in a car accident and all of a sudden need a level of care we never even imagined. I want to make sure that that care system is as strong as possible. And I want to make sure that every American can get the right health care at the right time at an affordable cost. And it has to be quality health care. And that means I will consider any proposal really carefully. But the, it's really important to understand how this will play out on the ground because people's lives are at stake. I want to ask you very briefly, Senator Hassan, about the Mueller report, the Attorney General's summary of it. Now the Attorney General says he'll release a redacted version in a few weeks. What will you be looking for in that redacted version? Well, first of all, I, I think the entire report should be made public. Obviously, if there are classified items in there, uh, they have to be dealt with as such. Uh, but, you know, we have um, congressional leaders who can sit with the administration and are uh, allowed under law to get highly classified information, and they should be able to see the full report. There are also uh, other legal requirements uh, that say that grand jury information is usually kept secret, but there are steps that can be taken to make that public too. Uh, I want to understand what happened here. This is about Russia attacking our democracy, the most fundamental part of our democracy, which is our election system. And so I want to understand what happened. I want to understand who was engaged in what. I want us to be able to counter Russia and any other country that thinks that they can interfere with our elections. And that's why it's critical that we see this entire report. I also have to say that even before he issued this report, the special counsel conducted an investigation that resulted in 37 different indictments, three companies, 34 individuals, six of whom were advisors to the now president of the United States. So you're not convinced by the AG's summary that the president had no fingers in the pie? Uh, that isn't, as I understand, what the AG said about the Mueller report. I think the AG said that Mr. Mueller said the president was not exonerated and that he couldn't prove a conspiracy. And I certainly hope the president wasn't conspiring. But I still am very concerned that six advisors to the president of the United States um, were indicted. We have had 
multiple guilty pleas. We have had one person found guilty by a jury. We have had five people sentenced here. Um, This is serious stuff. And I want to understand, too, why it is that the president of the United States takes the word of Vladimir Putin over our own intelligence officials. In terms of Russian interference in our elections. He stood in Helsinki with Vladimir Putin and told the world that he took Putin's word over our intelligence professionals professionals about Russian interference. He's also, by the way, uh, said he'd take uh, Kim Jong-un's word over that of our intelligence professionals, too. I want to understand why this president is willing to prefer Russian oligarchs over American intelligence officials. And that concerns me greatly. So we just need to see the report. In the meantime, though, uh, we also need to keep doing the work uh, that our constituents rightly call on us to do, which is to reach across the aisle and find ways to help small businesses and working families to lower the cost of health care, to keep our country safe, secure, and free. Well, and that's really that, that's also really important. People are going to read the report and make their own conclusions from it. That's the question I wanted to ask you, Senator Hassan. As you know, Republicans and President Trump are promoting this report as a huge victory, validating their claim that this has been a witch hunt all along. Now, we just heard you disagree with that. But I do wonder how much will further investigations – you know, special committees of Congress right. and so forth. How much does more and more attention to this reinforce that Republican narrative that this is just politics and Democrats aren't interested in the country's business? They're just focused on this witch hunt. Well, well, first of all, I think that what we now know from the attorney general is that he wrote, what was it, a three-page letter, a four-page letter about a 400-page report. So there's more in the report that we need to see in order to understand uh, what to make of it. Uh, I also frankly think the fact that uh, Mr. Mueller may not have found reasons to charge or indict the president of the United States doesn't mean we should be satisfied with the president of the United States' behavior. Um, I don't think it's good for the president of the United States to uh, fail to stand up to Russia and take action when it is been conclusively proved that they interfered with our elections. Uh, I want to understand what happened here because I don't want any foreign power to ever again interfere with the foundation of our democracy, which is fair and free elections. Americans need to have confidence in our election system so that we can come together and take on these difficult challenges we have. We are seeing an economy in transition, and it is transitioning faster than anything we've ever seen before. We need to come together and work on workforce training, um, a whole slew of other issues, climate change, healthcare. We've talked about them today. And that starts with having the kind of free and fair elections that give us all confidence in our system. Well, Senator Hassan, there's a lot more we could have talked about, right. but I really appreciate you coming in today. And we'll talk to you again. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for having me. That's New Hampshire U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan, a Democrat, a former governor. She sits on the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, also the Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee. The Exchange is a production of New Hampshire Public Radio. Our engineer is Dan Colgan. Our senior producer is Ellen Grimm. Our producers are Jessica Hunt, Christina Phillips, and Ali Oshinsky. Our theme music was written by Bob Lord, and I'm Laura Kanoy.